Hey guys, Shannon here at That Tile Chick. Today I'm going to be showing you how to install concrete tile for a backsplash around a freestanding tub. Hey guys, Shannon here at That Tile Chick. Welcome to my channel. Today I will be showing you how to install a concrete tile backsplash for a freestanding tub. So, First thing I want to talk about is the prep for concrete tile. Um, because concrete is extremely porous and dry, you need to seal the tile prior to installation. It is recommended that you seal it at least twice the entire tile. Let it dry completely and then you can install it. I will drop a picture of what concrete tile installed look li looks like without being sealed, so you can see the difference. What happens is the moisture in the thin set will get absorbed into the tile, and it will make the tile look permanently wet. So it will just darken the entire tile, and it just looks like it's been soaking in water. So some tiles will do it, some won't. It won't be coherent throughout the entire install, so it's definitely important to seal your concrete tile. So that's that would be step one. So the next step would be to prepare the area. You can see here that all the drywall has been cut out. Um, I've pre-measured so we know that it's about, um, it's just under three feet high and it's five feet by five and a half feet long. Um, and so what you're going to want to do is take out any nails, clean up the clean up the area and I will demonstrate there's a screw here and some extra drywall so I'm just going to take my multi-tool and I'll just cut that out and take that screw out and big deal. Um, but the area is already clean um, and this specific tile manufacturer required party backer. Um, me personally I prefer to use other substrates however your tile manufacturer will be king depending on what you're using, what material it is, who it is that manufactures it, and you definitely want to take the time to check out their instructions so that you can get a good install and follow their directions. Um, so I will be, I measured five, so it's five foot five in length, and my hardy backer board is three by five. So if I was just to cut this down to the height and then put a full five foot sheet here, I would, I would land like about here. There's no stud to secure it to. You do not want that to happen. That will cause extreme deflection. Your tile will crack. Your, your install will not last. So I'm going to cut it back to here. I have plenty. I, I've gotten plenty of material to um, make up for the difference. So I will, I will cut my hardy board from the middle of this stud all the way to the middle of this stud to allow for both of the pieces to butt up here in the corner. Um, and then also so that I have the proper distance to secure my, my board. Um, so yes, even though you may be thinking, oh cool, I have a five foot sheet, I'll just cut it down to the height and then leave the whole five foot sheet. When you get here, you're gonna have an issue or you have to add some sort of backing here with studs and that just, to me, it takes extra time. So I would rather just make a cut here and secure it that way. Once you're done with that, you want to use hardy backer screws if you're using hardy backer and install, you screw your hardy backer into the studs with the hardy backer screws. If you're using a different, um, a different substrate, drywall or some sort of purdy board, the foam board products, they call for a different screw. But like I said, the manufacturer's instructions are always king, so I am going to use the hardy backer screw. Um, and then after that, I'm set to tile. There's no waterproofing that is needed because this isn't, there's going to be a freestanding tub here, so it's not going to be submerged in water. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so I'm outside all set up. I'm just going to mark my cuts, and then I'll get cutting. Quarters. 
So now I'm going to just double check. Good. Okay. So now I'm going to get my grinder, put on my protection, and I'm going to make these cuts. Okay, so we have our cement board in place. We've figured out our layout. I've thrown up a ledger board at the bottom here. So I know I will get some questions why my ledger board is a few inches off the ground. The reason for that is we knew um, after speaking with the client that she wanted the tile to come up to here to sit flush with the counter backsplash here. So to alleviate having random starting from the floor and having some random length cut at the top that would look ugly instead i decided i'm going to throw out my laser here and based on the measurements of the tile i measured from here to the floor and i knew you with simple division you can just divide the entire length by the size of the tile and it will give you the amount of full tiles plus your cut. So I knew that it was going to be eight full tiles plus uh, a quarter, three quarters of a tile, I'm sorry, at the bottom, or if I started from the floor, it would be somewhere at the top. So I'm going to, what I did was I fit, found out that it would be from this spot to the top of the ledger board would be 32 inches, which divides evenly for eight full tiles. And then whatever is left over at the bottom will be three quarters of the tile and the cut will be meeting the floor. There's Saltillo tile down here. Um, if you've ever seen it, it's very imperfect. There's a lot of variation. So it will allow us to get a, a nice scribe closer to the floor versus having a factory edge try to meet the Saltillo tile at the bottom. So we kind of hit, you know, kill two birds with one stone, so to say. Um, next, to get the width, we have both walls, they're 65 inches in length across. So again, I started off, first spoke with the client, she would like to have a full tile here. So before I crush my client's dreams, I try to figure out with math how the layout's going to work. Um, so she was able to get a full tile here, I'm going to do because if you do 65 divided by the amount of my tile we're going to get another eight full tiles across and then we're going to end up with a one inch cut here in the corner um, what i'm able to do then is because it's a pattern i'll cut off the one inch and then i'll continue the pattern around so this corner doesn't look wonky continue the pattern around and then with math again i'm able to figure out that i will have um, one inch less of a tile starting here plus seven full tiles and then a three inch cut here which is tucked away in the corner and is not so much of a um, a focal point so I think that that gives us the best layout and gives the client what she wants that makes everybody happy um, so yes I have my ledger board here this is the shooter profile some people prefer to install with this up um, since I know that I'm going to have eight tiles, I'm just going to get started and I'm going to start from the left wall over there by the trim. And I'm going to start at the bottom, work my way up and work my way over. And then I will continue. I just put this here in the laser as a guide because I know that that's where I'm supposed to end up. And then once I get to the top row, I will chuck in my Schluter profile and everything will be good to go. 
One thing I want to mention is when you're using hardy backer, you want to make sure you tape the seams with mesh tape. They make mesh tape um, designed specifically for cement board. So you want to make sure you get it. It's even gray like your cement board. So the one for drywall is usually white. So um, very easy to figure out which one you need. Um, anyway, so yes, we'll get started and see you later. Okay, so right now I'm just laying out the tile because there is a slight pattern. There's the circles on the corners and then they have the squares. So this creates like a little filigree pattern here and then this has a little geometric pattern here in this corner. So I guess it, it alternates. Filigree, geometric, filigree, geometric. Each tile is exactly the same, however, its orientation will be different. So just wanna I just wanted to familiarize myself and make sure there wasn't something I was missing before I started sticking them on the walls. Um, but it's a pretty simple layout. I mean, it's a pretty simple pattern. Um, so I'm going to get started. So right now I'm just going to stick my mesh tape before I start tiling. I'm not going to do this one yet just because I'm going to probably do, you know, a few rows up and work my way this way first before I get all the way up to the top. These two items are my best friend and they're the most important things for keeping your install clean. Um, also, obviously, a nice clean bucket of water will also help you out tremendously. So these two items. Plus I have little picks by Husky. Those help as well to scrape the extra thin set out. I wait till the thin set, you know, maybe after a good hour or so, you can really, it just, it's not all the way dry, but it's more solid and you can pull it out. When the thin set's more wet, it runs and you can scrape it out, but it will still glop up in certain spots. But these two while installing and the picks afterwards, which I will show you. Let's get to it. Oh, I wanted to mention, um, I decided because these walls are, they're not perfect, they're not flat, there's humps and valleys all over the place. I'm installing a half inch concrete tile. Um, I have to meet up with a profile, so I want to, I decided that I'm going to use a half inch notch trowel on the wall and I will burn in my thin set to the back of the tile. What that means is just adding a thin layer. So you'll see me do it in a, in a minute. Um, it's just, you're adding like a nice thin layer onto the back of the tile. It's not, it, it's not thick. It's, you can't stick your finger in it. It's just, you burn it into the back of the tile real good. And then they call that a mechanical bond to the back of the tile and then when you add the thin set to the, you burn the thin set into the wall with the flat side of the trowel, then you make the notches. The notches are to adhere the tile to the wall. When you burn in thin set on the tile and on the wall, that creates a mechanical bond with the thin set to the substrate and the, and the tile that you're using. Some people will put, they'll back butter, back butter meaning adding, um, ridges on the wall and adding ridges on the tile. I consider that back buttering. Burning in is a little bit different. Burning in is just that. Back buttering is that, then ridges. Um, always on the wall though. Not a, if your wall is perfect, you don't necessarily need to add the thin set ridges onto the wall. You can do the tile if you're using a bigger tile, but for this, it's extra work less efficient for me to just burn the thin set in on the wall and then put ridges on every single tile i'm just going to put ridges on my substrate then i will burn in the thin set on the back of the tile and i will get a nice um, bond but i decided to use a half inch notch trowel because of all the variances in the wall i want to make sure that i get as much coverage as possible so without further ado I'm going to start tiling. Now I'm wiping down the tile only because it's concrete. 
and I don't want it to suck the moisture out of my thin set very quickly. And I'm going to do the same with the wall. Just, I, this is very lightly wet. It's not soaking, so. That's burning in. And I'm going to do the same thing to the wall where I'm going to be working. And now I'm only going to do enough for the first two rows because I know that's where I'm starting. And I also wanna make sure my thin set stays good and doesn't, I don't know, I call it stale. That's just my personal, everybody has their own term. It goes bad, it gets dry and crusty. We don't want dry and crusty thin set. And depending how fast you work, you can kind of gauge how far you're going to be able to go. Um, I'm only going to go a little bit out because this is my first um, this is my start of the install, and I want to make sure nothing goes wrong. And I didn't mess up my measurements or anything. So I'm just going to apply a thicker layer so I can go back with my notches. It's kind of like decorating a cake, I feel like. And you can always tell, so these are good, this is not. So I know I need some more thin set over here. I'm just going to go across and you can collect some thin set from where you have a lot and bring it back over to spots that need some more. And depending on the angle of the trowel, the more flat you keep it, the like the sh the deeper the ri the ridges will be. If you are angling it a little bit, you can add a little bit of thin set onto the wall while you're creating your notches, notches, ridges, whatever. So I'm going to add here. I know I need a lot there. I need some there. The other thing um, is, you see I'm putting my ridges in all the same direction. They're all going up. In this, set, in this case, it doesn't matter as much only because my tiles are the same on all sides. But if my tile was shorter in any one direction, I would want to put my my notches in that direction. So if it was like a subway tile and obviously the longer side is going the length of the wall, my marks would still be going this way because their subway tiles are short running uh, lengthwise, height, vertical, vertical. Um, but if I was laying the subway tile in the opposite orientation and the long way was going vertical, my um, ridges would be going the other way. So is the shortest distance of the tile. Technically, technically, that allows the air to escape quicker. 
And when the air escapes quicker, you get a bond, a tighter bond between your tile and the substrate. So, oh, another thing I want to do really quick is I just want to clean this goop here. You see it just builds up. This is just where the tile, the joints are going to, the grout joint is going to land, and I don't want excess thin set there for no reason. So here goes my first tile. Okay, so I'm just going to press it down. So I'm just cleaning out the joint before I'm putting in my spacer. I'm gonna do the same to this side here. Just get all that out so it's as clean as possible. fairly happy with this one, so I'm going to keep on going. So the same rule applies for the each tile. You want to just get out as much stuff you can before laying the next one. So a nice rule of thumb when you start your install is to check for coverage for um, behind your tiles. What you don't want to see is the ridges transfer onto the back of your tiles. Like you want it to look like mountains. Um, so you don't want to have these. You want more like rocky mountains. And I will show you what that means. I usually do it on my first or second tile. Um, so now I'm over here and I'm just going to pull this guy off and I'm going to check. So that's what it should look like. 
you don't want to see this transferred onto the back of your tile that means you have air gaps in your tile um, and that can cause like it could just cause hollow spots behind the tile and then it can also cause the tile to fall off the wall um, that's just not good coverage so this is pretty dang good coverage um, I have a spot here though that I want to add some thin set to so I'll probably just take it from over here to go. some thin set on here and have ridges um, right above your, your profile leg here. But I know I have enough thin set behind my tiles. I'm just going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to push it in from the top. I've already made my miters prior to. So. Okay, so now we have come to the inside corner where um, we have chosen to do a wrap. So what does that mean? Um, so there, you can see there's like about an inch left. Normally, you can cut, we would have cut an inch tile and then um, we would come back. Let me get a, let me get a tile for an example. Hold on just because of the pattern on this tile if your client wants a wrap you have to keep into account your pattern so normally um if this wasn't a pattern tile you'd say okay let me cut an inch piece because that's what's left this is still technically a wrap it just wouldn't work for this and then you could put your other tile here like that but you can see that the pattern gets messed up. So what you have to do is take into account the thickness of the tile that would be covering the other tile. So you would cut your small piece even smaller like this and then the other one is going to join it at the corner there just like that so you can see that the pattern can continue nicely and your lines match up and then you still get your nice corner joint for expansion and actually look at all the room you get for expansion in the corner there you can continue your wrap with a nice pattern get these small pieces in and then I'm going to move on to tiling the next wall. I will probably start from the bottom like I did before and work my way, work my way, just like I did, row by row.
Okay, so today I am going to do all my, well, most of the cuts. We got all of the full tiles in yesterday. Um, this corner behind me was giving me a lot of trouble at the end of the day, and I just said, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to come back tomorrow. So today I am starting with the bottom row. I took out the ledger board and um, cleaned up. So like there was goops of thin set under here. So I just took a chisel and I just scraped it away so that there's no um, thin set in my way when I go to set the bottom row. Clean that up a little bit. I added my mesh tape um, to the bottom parts of the seams under here. And so the way I like to get my cuts for the bottom row, <clears throat> what I'll do is so this one, the orientation, the next tile would be like this. So I just literally flip it over, put it against the, uh, the tile above, and I mark and mark. So I'll make a little mark here on the side. And that will give me what I'm cutting off at the bottom. So now you also have to take into account your spacing um, we know i know i want a 16th at the floor and my my uh, my joint spacing is 330 seconds so i'm going to take into account that i need extra room for the floor spacing and extra room for my grout spacing um, so I'll make my line and my blade on my wet saw is an eighth of an inch. So I know that if I make my line, take the line using my blade, that's more than enough to accommodate for my grout joint and the joint at the floor. Here's an example. Um, so I will, I'm going to focus on doing this. Um, I'll show a quick video of me making the mark and cutting it on the saw so you have an example of what I am talking about. But just always remember, so this method, it's, it's good because you can move quicker um, instead of taking nor normally, because we know that this floor isn't completely flat, this is Saltillo tile, and traditionally any floor that you're going against is probably not going to be perfect. So if you make a straight cut, you're going to have spots that are either tight or too loose um, so it is best to normally traditionally you would take the measurement from this corner and this corner and then draw a line but this way it's a little bit more efficient and quick you just flip the tile over you mark you mark and you already know you need to accommodate for another eighth of an inch you take your line with the blade on the wet saw good to go um, 95 percent of the time it's perfect there's a 5% chance that sometimes, I don't know, you may have just marked wrong. You know, we're humans, we make mistakes, so you might have to do the cut again. But traditionally, usually, it works really well. Let's get to it. Let's do it. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> okay, guys, so check this out. When I was talking before about accommodating for the thickness of my blade, uh, over here I have it set up so that the blade hits the outside of the line over there. This is going to be the piece I'm installing on this side. This is the cut that's getting thrown away. So it's making my cut piece smaller. So I'm a cut. if I was to put the blade on the opposite side of the line, it would make my piece larger and not accommodating for that eighth inch, one eighth of an inch for my spacers and expansion and all of that good stuff. So I'm taking, I'm going on the inside of the line towards the cut I'm keeping so that it makes the piece shorter. So usually when you make a cut on a wet saw or with a snap cutter, 
the tile edge will have some chipping or imperfections. You can clean this up with a diamond pad on a variable speed grinder or with a hand pad. So here you'll see that I am burning in the thin set onto the substrate and I'm not using my trowel to make the ridges on the wall. I'm only doing that here because it's harder to get my trowel into this small space. So what I'm doing instead is burning in the thin set on the substrate and then I will use the same method, burn in the thin set on the tile and then also back butter the ridges and stick it to the wall. Okay, so we are all done tiling. I just removed the spacers from the bottom row that we completed before lunch. So now I am just going to uh, take a wet microfiber cloth and I'm going to go over and clean all the tiles. Like I started over here. Um, every single time, I, while I am tiling, I also clean. Like I use that little brush like we mentioned earlier, those picks. I make sure that I keep my project as clean as possible while I'm going so I don't have to spend hours cleaning either at the end of the day or you know two days later even worse when I'm done tiling completely. The faster you clean up the thin set, the easier it will be for you. If you put in a little bit of effort while you're doing it or even if you just tile a section and then you go back throw in your spacers and clean it up after before the thin set dries it just makes when you're done like i'm done i'm tired i can't wait to grout i don't have to sit here and scrub joints and you know possibly chip a tile which i've done before while you're cleaning out the joint so that's a big thing like i would hate to have to chip this tile right here in the middle of all these tiles and risk having to remove this one and chipping more so i just like i just like to do it while i go keep my install clean so that when i'm ready to grout i can just grout i do a nice clean quick wipe the microfiber cloth and then i move on with my life so see i can see i have a little stuff right there that's it really simple um so i'm going to continue on this way um, I just go in circular motions and I keep an eye out for the joints, see if there's any spots that I might have missed. 
cleaning while I was doing the install. So I have this big chunk down here, so I'll probably just use like my wedge or my spacer that's nearby, scrape it off. Use my rag, use some elbow grease, comes right off. And that's because I just set this tile a few hours ago. So that makes cleaning almost effortless. I think I scrub my bathroom shower harder than this. So this is not a big deal. Okay, so once you're all done cleaning your area, double checking for any thin set that might be stuck in the grout joints, you're ready to grout. So you need a clean bucket of water. Um, if you buy this kind of thin set, and this isn't a plug or anything, but they come with the sponge. Some people don't like it, but I do, and I'll tell you the reason when I'm grouting. But this brand is Mapei Flex Color CQ. It's a pre-mixed, pre-sealed acrylic-based grout. So it's already mixed in the bucket, ready to use. Um, I like it because it's acrylic based. It won't, it won't change color over time or lose its color over time because the pigments aren't added later. That's just made this color. So that's why I prefer this grout over the basic cement based grout, um, mostly for that reason. The premix is a little bit harder to use versus when you mix it yourself, but I think it saves me time and I like it, so that's what I use. So I'm gonna get started. I like to take the whole cover off. And so I use this, I've used this grout before. Um, I save buck, I save them because if I don't use the entire bucket, I'm not gonna throw it away. Um, and it usually comes with this sponge. I like this sponge because it has nice flat edges, so when I, after I get the grout in the joint, I can do a nice circular motion to get the grout that's on the tile off. So I will demonstrate. I'm going to just start over here. You just get your grout float, get some on there. It's very stiff, so it usually doesn't fall off all the way. And then you just go against the joint and you want to work in semi small areas you don't want to start over here and then 15 minutes later end up on the other wall and try to come back and clean this grout off like I said it's acrylic based once it starts to dry it is very strong and power be to thee who try to get it off the wall Typically, it will not stain the tile. This is concrete tile, so since it's much more porous than your average porcelain tile, um, I am going to probably work in a little bit of a smaller area just to get it off. Again, the tiles have been sealed, so I'm not too worried about it, but I still don't like to take chances. So I don't press, I just go lightly in a circular motion to get this off the tile. And you might need to flip the sponge over. And you don't want your sponge to be dripping wet because what you don't want to happen is to get the joint too wet and pull out the thin set, not the thin set, pull out the grout that you just added in there. So I'll just take off as much as I can, go back to my bucket, rinse out the sponge real well. And I don't know, the Mapei sponges, they have this sud, like, I don't know, it just has these suds on it. I don't know if it's meant for the grout. I don't know. I, I, I'm sure if I did some research, I could find out why, but Mapei, why? Why? Can you tell me, please? Um, so, circular motions. Sometimes you gotta use some elbow grease. So you can see how this, the grout wants to really stick to this tile. So I'll probably have to re-go over this because it got pulled out over there. So 
So you'll notice I'm using the ground flow in all different angles. Um, when, I, when I'm applying it, I use a shallow angle like this, and I try to go as flat against the tile as possible because I really want to push the grout in there. When I want to take all this excess away, I'm using a sharp angle. But I usually come, I'm not going to come this way because what's going to happen is this can get stuck in the joint here and pull out, and that's not what I want. So flat, then I'll go the opposite direction, and I will use a sharp angle to try to wipe off the excess. Okay guys, so that concludes our tub surround backsplash, or whatever you prefer to call it. Um, so we came in, we had studs, we installed hardy backer board, then we applied mesh tape to all of the seams that is rated for cement, board, cement backer board. After that, we went over our layout using measurements and some minor math to find out what would be the best layout and also to fit the customer's uh, wants. Then after that, we planned to start tiling from this side here and work our way around. So we started here with all the full tiles. We burnt, we wet the back, we wet the backer board, we wet the back of the tile, then we burned in the thin set or key in the thin set on the back of the, I mean on the hardy backer board. Then we also did the same to the back of the tile and then we used a half inch notch trowel on the backer board and applied our tile. So again, oh, I forgot to mention that we had a ledger board here. So the last thing we did was the very last row here at the bottom. Reason for that is because the floor, not just because this is Saltillo tile, but I didn't install the tile. So it has a lot of bumps and ridges, peaks and valleys, and the floor is not perfectly level. So if you look really close, you can see that there are variations in the cuts at the bottom. I was able to get it super tight with my method of flipping the tile over and taking a mark from either side. So that's my reason for using a ledger board here. I left that for last and I did that today. So we did all the tile, removed the ledger board, did our last row, we added in our last cut here and our cuts along the side. Then I did a nice clean, used a microfiber rag to clean all of the tiles and went over the joints again, made sure that I didn't have any thin set build up in there. Then I grouted the entire area with Mape Flex Color CQ, cleaned it with the Mape sponge. Then last and final step is to caulk. You want to caulk any changes of plane. Um, I also caulked this area here where the Schluter profile meets the wall. Caulked over here, the inside corner. and over here where the tile is going to meet and over here where the tile is going to meet the the trim here the only place i did not caulk is around the bottom because everywhere else if you can see the tile center who did the floor used a gray caulk I'm assuming, or thin set, something, and that goes along the bottom. So to keep it cohesive, the client has gray all around the bottom, so gray is going to be taken all around here as well. So that about sums it up. Oh, after you, after you grout 
What you want to do is also go back over with a microfiber cloth again, just to clean if you have any haze. Usually, um, usually if you are fast and the more experience you have with it, you, can, you should be able to get 90% of the haze off while you're cleaning and grouting. So, but I know the first couple times I've done it, I had to go back two and three times because there would just be haze left that I just didn't see because you're, you're grouting, you're stopping, you're cleaning, you're grouting, so you can miss an area and that's okay. It's just gonna take a little bit of scrubbing. I recommend using, hold on, spray away glass cleaner to clean any grout haze that you might have. Oh, I don't have my microfiber cloths, but you just spray it on, buff it out with the microfiber cloth, and you're good to go. Um, it makes it a lot easier. It takes all the, you don't have to scrub as hard. The microfiber kind of pulls it out. So that's my recommendation. So yes, without further ado, I will see you guys next time. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any comments, questions, or requests for videos in the future, please leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Um, love you guys. See you next time.